All right, we have been dying to talk about this, and every weekend, every week after an episode airs, pretty much since like around episode five, uh, the group chat that we started to kind of talk about Invincible uh, has been hopping. Generally, the texts don't talk even talk about the show; it's just us going, "Holy fucking shit!" Um, so guys, it's time to finally get some extended time in to talk about uh, X Men ninety seven. And joining me, uh, no two better men for the job. Um, with two very different. Uh, X-Men stories. Uh, first off, joining us uh, is from Fan Club, uh, by the way, uh, releasing a new EP uh, available uh, very, very shortly. And with a Dublin gig coming up, it is the one and only Kev Keane. Um, Kev, uh, we kind of cajoled you into watching X-Men again when we were watching. We just kind of did social pressure on you when we were watching Invincible. Um, how are you feeling on the other sides? Uh, I, I put a message into the group chat last week saying... You know, we started this group chat for Invincible, and Invincible was great. This might have been a like as an experience for me, like a better animated experience, and I fucking loved it. It was unreal. We'll get we'll get to that, but I'm ecstatic about the series. Yeah, I can't Amazing. believe it. Amazing, yeah. delighted, delighted you did. <clears throat> and uh, also joining us as always, whenever we discuss all things Marvel, it is Dan, 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 Dan Dan Lynham, uh, and obviously, Dan, uh, anytime we have you on to talk about Marvel, because as anyone who is watching the video can see, uh, and you have your X-Men comics in the background, you are a, a proper X-Men aficionado, and you're the guru when it comes to this. So this must be something that uh, you were really looking forward to, or at least had a lot of, had and have a lot of thoughts about and opinions about from a, a f pure fandom standpoint. Without a doubt. I mean, as we discussed when we had our first intro to this thing, I went in with incredibly high expectations, kind of the ones that are never met. And the initial episode, as we discussed, let me down for a number of reasons, which I've had a lot of time to analyze. But my, expecta my expectations, the initial ones, have completely been like circumnavigated. Everything I want from this, not only did I get, I got in spades, and I was completely wrong at the start. The end result, this was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And look, there's no, usually with kind of conversations like this, we'd be giving it away to say like how we felt about it. But like, I think if you're, if you're dialed into the X-Men 97 discussion at all, you know that everyone loves this. This has been a runaway success. So this is more an X-Men appreciation discussion. Um, but guys, look, you've seen the episode title, so no complaints. Like, we're going to be going into the spoilerverse here. We're going to be talking all things X-Men uh, and all things X-Men 97. We're going to talk about the animated series, I'm sure, as well as we go on. Uh, and we're going to talk about storylines from there. We may, uh, since we've got the benefit of having Dan here, we may kind to go into some of the comic lore however we're not going to be going ahead the one thing that's got me about the discussion around X-Men is because they're referring to incidents that happen so widely in the comics and I've read a fair share of X-Men comics but there's just so many of them that like I can't I, I haven't even scratched the surface but uh, a lot of people have been kind of uh, very loose with spoilers and being like oh if they're doing this storyline that means this is going to happen we're not going to do that to you guys we're not going to tell you what's going to happen in the show but we may give you out of context and kind of use the benefit of having uh, a guru like Dan here as well um, and give you kind of stuff that will enhance your viewing pleasure but before we get into the episode and our thoughts itself we're going to take you back into the last episode we've watched it very recently we're coming very hot off the presses it was only released around nine hours ago I watched it minutes after it was released and loved every second uh, so let's do that as we always do with our alternate recap and guys you may notice I have a bit of a change up in the background music for it because I had to of course guys so let's do it for the last episode and we'll get into tolerance is extinction part three and charles xavier takes magneto back to a memory of them coming out to each other as mutants only to reveal that he was catfishing and was actually going to destroy his mind forever to reverse what he'd done to be fair i wish the last three girls who catfished me would have given me the same heads up because they kind of ended up doing the same thing a lot of therapy builds just gone to pure waste lads uh, Xavier turned the lecky on. I wonder if he tried the fuse box before immediately mind wiping Magnus. Uh, waking Bastion up as he had Beast, Storm and Forge hostage. Uh, monologuing just long enough for Jean Ray to go full Phoenix as she turned Sinister into the old woman in the shower from The Shining. She can't hold Bastion down for long though because then the finale would have just been 10 minutes. So he goes into Space Bastion mode and flies to Asteroid M. 
Gene gives uh, Scott a heads up what's coming as he tries to wake up Wolverine by reminding him about his wife in a weird but also probably smart tactic. I think it kind of worked. Bastion arrives, but he's cut off by a rogue who's jacked up on grief, who gets an assist from Roberto, of all people, who picks now of all moments to say, the name's Sunspot. Not the time, dude. That superhero name is so mid. You may as well have said, the name's Stain. Come, Stain. It's like it doesn't hit in that moment with the stakes as high. As it appears, Xavier and Magneto are being overwhelmed by their minds. The X-Men all unite, but can't put Bastion down. He's like the big show in the Royal Rumble. Who's gonna throw that guy over the top rope? Eventually they decide genocide is actually all right if you're sad about it and take it. If you can't beat them, join them stance and try recruit them to the team. Unfortunately, just as this peace treaty is about to be signed, President Kelly invokes the Magneto Protocols and bombs Asteroid M. This literally achieves nothing but speed up, speeds up humanity's imminent demise as all the mutants live thanks to Gene's protection but aren't able to stop the asteroid hurtling towards Earth and a dinosaur-like extinction event. Scott and Gene say goodbye to Nathan by saying he has Scott's eyes, which are big red destructive yokes. It's kind of like Bin Laden's son being proud that he has his dad's beard. Uh, but before they can blow themselves up to save an Earth that doesn't want them, Xavier is able to remind Magneto just who the hell he is just in time. He steers the asteroid away, but it mysteriously disappears in space. Six months later, and Bishop shows up to tell the Forge, who's already constructing a new fantasy X-Men squad, but it's not about where the X-Men are, it's when. That when is 3000 BC Egypt for Nightcrawler, Beast, Xavier, Rogue, and Magneto with N Sabor and Nora, uh, and while Cyclops and Jean end up 2000 years in the future with a child Nathan. It's adorable how everyone ended up with their romantic connection in the timeline that they went to. Oh, and by the way, in present day Genosha, Apocalypse shows up. Good luck with that, Roberto and Jubilee. And that was season three, uh, the season one finale of X Men 97. Tolerance is Extinction Part 3. And guys, we haven't caught up on X-Men 97. We touched on it when we were discussing Invincible, as we said. Uh, but we haven't had a chance to really catch up on it. Um, we'll get into the, kind of the finale thoughts. Dan, you said you kind of turned around your opinion of it. And this series seems to kind of won you over. What were your thoughts specifically on the finale itself? The finale was excellent um, for a number of reasons. One thing was, like you mentioned at the start of the of the podcast that everyone's been giving their two cents on if this happens this is happening uh which i think they did very well but they've kind of swerved us in the end so going into it assuming i knew what was going to happen but then having the rug somewhat pulled out from underneath me and seeing something quite fresh was really really good um as far as the drama and what they're doing with these characters i mean the last couple of episodes have really felt like someone who genuinely loves this franchise is finally getting the chance to write the story that they wrote as a kid on like you know their copy books when they should have been paying attention in school and that's not like where all those really good stories come from those really hungry fiery stories that you know really set new standards uh x-men was one of them and it kind of had no right being as good as it was the final episode was an absolutely fantastic like closer but also, now that we know season two is coming, as of officially only a month or two ago, we know kind of like, we thought we know where this is going, it's going somewhere else now. So I just thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, Kev, your own thoughts, uh, obviously, coming into this, uh, you know, having not watched the animated <clears throat> series beforehand and just kind of jumping in fresh and kind of not mm. knowing what to expect. Uh, I know you've loved this series, but what were your thoughts on the finale and how they rounded off? Yeah, like, well, I, I'd watched it at the original ones as a, as a kid, so um, uh, I hadn't watched it recently, I suppose, but it was it was great. It was a, it was a brilliant sh series in general. I've just been able to jump in, kind of, and I know I did, like, a bit of a YouTube recap, I think, of the first five series of it, but, like, this was just uh, very accessible, I kind of thought, at the start, mm -hmm. and we got to talk about up to season, or episode four, I think, when we were talking about it in Invincible. Yeah. The next fucking week is the Genosha episode, which I think was like the pivotal point. Like I think it's up for an Emmy nomination now, where yeah. it's been considered for an Emmy, like as well. It was that good, um, and that just completely changed the the tone of the show as well. I think um, into really more like kind of uh, adult themes, I suppose, as well. Like and um, it it brought it in a kind of a bit more of a, a darker direction. And by the time the finale came around, 
you didn't. I, it was kind of like an, a little bit, and I don't mean to kind of keep comparing uh, to Invincible just because we started watching it with that. You didn't know if someone was going to die or not in that finale. Mm. And I thought that was a very different to most shows you kind of watch. You'd be like, ah, they're a main cast. They're going to be fine. But like, obviously, with spoilers here, with, with Gambit dying in the Genosha episode, like my my heart was on my mouth the entire time for that uh for the whole finale um especially when when Bastion's on screen I thought Bastion was a really good villain but we can maybe talk about him later but uh yeah I adored the finale and um I'm gonna have to ask Dan and maybe Dan will like explain some of this later about what exactly happened in the very last bit in the future I've no idea about any of that I know Apocalypse but the is it Ascanti. Was that what the let let we will we we'll make yeah. time for that because I do I want to pick will. your brain too Dan definitely a hundred percent um but well, yeah, yeah I'm excited for what they're setting up now in, the, in in season two though anyway um yeah what a show yeah yeah I I thought the finale and and Kev I know in our group chat you kind of were like forty three minutes and I was the exact same <laughs> just literally like refreshing Disney Plus at eight o'clock because like I started work at nine so I'm like refresh refresh refresh. Um, and then when I saw it was an extended episode, I'm like, yes. And you know what? Like sometimes extended episodes can feel like they're extended for the finale and they're kind of just like padding it out and so on. This could have been 60 minutes and it still would have been action packed. It felt like a tight 43 minutes. Like they felt like they were getting shit done and like they you barely had a moment to breathe, but it was so again, there's no criticism in there. It was perfectly ex- executed. And what I love is that and the series has done it time and time again within the 10 episodes, is that we ended last week on such a huge cliffhanger, obviously, uh, with Magneto kind of replicating an iconic comic scene of kind of uh, removing all the adamantium from Wolverine and leaving him, leaving him kind of in a critical state where he's, he's struggling to heal for the first time in his existence. Um, I audibly gasped at that cliffhanger. And then you're just thrown into... And this is a risk when storytellers do this, but it's also a sign of confidence when it's done well. They decided not to linger on that. One of our main characters, the main X-Men, the, the, the money, he, like this is the guy. It's They didn't say we're just going to do Deadpool 3. They said, no, actually, Deadpool and Wolverine. Let's just get it right and bring Wolverine into the mix. He is the, the money maker for X-Men. He is on death's door and they say, we're just going to leave him there and focus on some other stuff here. And they took us down a whole new avenue this week while not just writing off or undermining the importance of all that happened. That's still very much there. And they still want us to kind of respect that. Um, But this is a show that is marching to its own beat. Every second of this episode hit. Every second felt like a final scene. Um, Every second felt like this could be the end. And this is like the end of this storyline. They just kept raising the stakes and making it bigger. But also everything they did made sense from a character standpoint. Like one thing I loved as well is like... um. I rewatched all of the animated series for the first time since my childhood in anticipation of this. And the one thing, like, you love it, but you love it because of nostalgia. Like, if you were to say it's this great TV making, it's not really. Because there is an element of when you watch the animated series, every time the X-Men join up and start kicking someone's ass, they play the team in the background. It's like, and you're like, right, the X-Men are winning. I know what happens at the end of this. Um. What I loved about this is the show doesn't, it gives you everything you want from a nostalgia standpoint to remember how it felt, but like it doesn't rest on those tropes and it keeps you guessing. I loved the score in this. Like when Asteroid M looked destined to hit Earth, it felt like an apocalyptic Mm. event. You knew it wasn't going to be because you know season two has already been made because the whole thing with Bo DeMeo, the creator. For anyone who doesn't know, he left the series um, before season one aired. He is still tweeting about it and valuable and so on. Um, But season two was already in the can and he'd kind of written and done that. So again, don't expect a drop in quality for that. Uh, But we knew that was there. So we're like, obviously all of our characters aren't going to die and the world isn't going to be destroyed. But I still feel the stakes of that as well. This show had me gripped. I loved every second of it. um, And an absolute win. And yeah, I, I want to show love to this series, but I do want to focus in on some of the minor, well, not minor, but the major plot points. Uh, but just zoom in on them a bit. First off, um, Bastion. Um, someone that, again, mightn't be considered a traditional X-Men big bad. And what I like about this as well is 
Um, it reminds me of Across the Spider Verse, uh, using Spot, um, and kind of bringing him in as the big bad there. And it's like, like he can be a big bad. Like again, he's got all the powers that would make him a massive threat to anyone. Um, I loved them bringing him in as a big bad. Kev kind of coming to this like kind of fresh and years off kind of an X-Men rewatch. And um, mm. I guess you're looking at it kind of similar to me. Like I had some background on Bastion and I did a lot of research then obviously when he showed up, but I wasn't like, Oh, that's Bastion and he can do this, this and this. Um, what were your thoughts on him as a big bad? Yeah. I knew nothing at all about Bastion uh, kind of going into this. And I loved the, the, I guess the first half of this series, you thought Sinister was going to be the big bad. And then halfway through the season, it gets you get a big reveal of no, it's he's there's a there's another man behind the curtain here, Bastion. Um, I thought Theo is it Theo James mm. who voiced him. I thought he did a brilliant, brilliant job. I think he's he's actually a phenomenal get. I think for them in terms of uh, voice casting as well. I thought he stole every moment he was on screen um, as as a as a uh, a villain, I suppose. And because, like I said earlier, because of Gambit's death, every time he was on screen you don't know if someone was potentially going to die or not, um, especially in that, that finale. Um, the, <laughs> one thing I did love about the finale is, for some reason, when he got more powerful and maybe a bit more evil, his goatee got longer. So maybe his power source is from his goatee. I'm not really too sure. But, I like um... when his hair turned into like Wayne Static from Static X's hair. <laughs> for a while. It's like he's got the power of industrial music at the turn of the millennium. Yes. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he's just got some brilliant like that. That when he said to Jubilee, he's like, What have you got the power of July 4th? I think it was, yeah. And then she fucked up his face and made him look terrifying as well. Um, yeah, I thought it was brilliant, really, really good. Dan, what were your old thoughts on like when they introduced Bastion and you're kind of like, He's the big bad here, even more so than a much more established in the cartoon canon anyway, uh, villain and sinister. Um, what were your thoughts first when they introduced them and then where your expectations met, surpassed? Give us kind of your context on that. My expectations were definitely surpassed with Bastion because uh, I knew him from a story where he played a, like a kind of minor role uh, that came out when I was, I think, like 14, 15. Mm. I was reading X-Men a lot at that stage. And the thing about the X-Men comics back then which we'll definitely get into when we're talking about the future thing, is that they were so hokey and like kind of trippy and I would say, I wouldn't want to say psychedelic, but there was so much going on. There were so many titles. It was like you'd read an issue and then that would be your cause to do some research. So my first introduction to Bastion when he was playing second fiddle to a different character. And I did like a, I got a few back issues in the day, like read a few bits about him, but he was always a character that slipped under my radar, but I was well aware of like who he is. Halfway through the season, me and one of the guys I work with, Jack, uh, he's a huge X-Men fan as well. The two of us were theory craft and where things were going. We both came to the conclusion. It looks like what we're doing with the Sentinels is going to be Bastion. Any other characters they haven't put enough background into now or done the work to like introduce that character. So it was definitely the right time to bring him in. In the comics, he didn't have that imposing sort of terror that he really exuded in the TV show. So he did a very, very good job. Like you said, Spider-Verse was a fantastic um, simile to make because he was just very kind of insignificant for so long, but they took something with a good idea and made it so much more grand. And like Kev said, the Terminator Metallo-looking face that they did it at the end and just like his super cyber bird thing, Rick and Morty callback style was just, it was so <laughs> badass looking like total rule of cool here, full effect. But Bastion was portrayed better in this, in my opinion, than any of the comics I've read of him, which isn't a huge amount, but enough to kind of get a feel for him. So I was stoked with him as, as a bad guy. And I think he filled his purpose really, really well. I think you hit the nail on the head here when you said that this show felt like someone like who had like been doodling X Men like comics when they're in school and stuff like that. And obviously, Bo DeMeo is just a big like when I when I got into wrestling like when around like ninety nine or two thousand and I got back into wrestling, I was a huge Bob Buchanan fan for no reason. I just like caught on to him and like again he was a nobody in there, but obviously. 
Bastian is Bodemeo's Bull Buchanan. Jesus mm. Christ, I didn't realize that was going to be so difficult to say. <laughs> but, <laughs> he, this is his character. He, he's like, he could be great if you use him in the right way. And again, it's just the confidence of it because think of the expectations and the weight. You're bringing the X Men into Marvel at a time when they're being introduced to the MCU. You've got the reins of the show, the absolute balls to go we're gonna pick this minor character and just make him into the biggest heel ever and he's gonna boss around and make sinister his bitch basically and what i loved about him though was he's such a great heel like because as we know like again to to, to kind of continue with a wrestling kind of comparison great heels are sure they're the baby faces or they're victims of persecuted persecution and justifying their actions um and they believe everything they say and the best x-men stories really understand that like and we've got kind of we're going to talk about charles and 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 magneto in a moment and as well there's a question of who's the heel in that interaction as well because x-men is so good at kind of portraying that nuance um and there is a genuine sad story to back this up as well, like of a person who maybe just didn't get the opportunities that he could have and his life would have turned out differently. I loved as well his real just calm demeanor um, and the ability to kind of rationally explain his gripes that makes him so unbending and chilling like you can't reason with this guy because he's thought of everything a million times and his plan is watertight in his mind I also love a villain who can just take everything our heroes have and just keep getting back up there was that point in the finale where you're like here we go the X-Men are going to team together oh they're getting in shots on him this is the end and he just kept getting back up and it was just like I was exhausted by the end of it but I'm like this is this is fucking cool like this is cool the entire team can't lay a finger on this guy um, so yeah, loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, hope to see more of them in the future. Um, and great development from them just to kind of give us a whole new angle, uh, with a whole new villain. Um, it gave us a touch of the new and it gave us a touch of the old. Uh, there were a lot of cameos in this that again, I just wasn't expecting because while we had, um, you watch back the old animated series and you know, you get Wanda in there, I think you get Vision at some other times, I think like you get like people showing up strangers in it for a while too. Um, but they weren't the people we know. It's interesting watching now because we have all this additional Marvel backstory that we've gotten on them and they're more fleshed out in our heads as a result. But in this now, they know what they're doing by giving us these people. And the cameos we got in the last episode and this season as a whole, I'm just going to name some names. This isn't even a, an exhaustive list. Iron Man, Captain America, The Watcher. That was amazing. Um, Doctor Strange, Black Panther, uh, Spider-Man. There also appeared, I don't know if anyone noticed this, uh, it appeared like Walter White was sitting at the presidential table at one stage. Go back and look at it. It's like, <laughs> that's Walter White. Like That is 100% oh, Walter White. <laughs> What was your guys' favorite cameos, and what did you think about the way they used them, Dan? What What were your thoughts? Um, it was really cool seeing a lot of the characters that maybe aren't established in the MCU. I did do a little pop when I saw Cloak and Dagger mm. in this uh, episode, uh, being that they were such a, a crucial point of the Maximum Carnage storyline, which I was a big fan of. And then one thing that it kind of took me a full second to realize was we had a Spider-Man cameo, but of course we had the 90s cartoon Mary Jane and Peter Parker watching that TV. Yeah. And at first you're just like sitting back and watching it and you're like... <laughs> and then it twigs, which was brilliant. Like total fan service. They did a really, really great job. I loved seeing the, uh, the Iron Man uh, outfit that was relevant to the time it was mm. what do they call it i think back then it was called the modular outfit the modular armor i think there was been modular armor since then but that was the one when i first started reading the extended marvel comics uh just before they decided to get rid of a lot of those characters to keep the the outfits accurate to how they were depicted in the comics in 1997 was just that extra above and beyond they went to to really show the fans that they care Mm. Kev, what were your thoughts? Was there any particular uh, standouts for you, or or what were your own thoughts on the cameos? Uh, yeah, I, I loved loved them all. Um, it was very much the the Leonardo DiCaprio meme of like, hey, <laughs> pointing at the TV. Um, <laughs> I thought it, most people had a good functional kind of like nice Easter egg, um, kind of little, yeah, little cameo. And to be honest, it made the world seem so much bigger. 
I think, including all these other heroes, even though they didn't didn't have to do much. But Iron Man just stood around there doing nothing for that entire thing. Like, <laughs> literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I loved, I suppose, like Morph, I guess, gave us one per, per, per episode usually as well. That was... Yeah. That was kind of his role for the most part this season. I hope they do expand his role a little bit more because he was just like, "Oh my god, I turned into this week." Um, but I, I absolutely popped though for for Mister Fantastic when he turned into him. Yes, that was excellent. Like, yeah, or random um, Hulk as well. Like, and it's just like, okay, we're getting the Hulk, All right? Yeah. Enough. I don't know how that works. How does he have Hulk powers or whatever? But look, it works. I'm happy with it. Um, the Watcher was definitely my favorite because it was happening at a point where the stakes were raising in the episode so far. And then you're just like, oh my God, the Watcher, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm like, what? Like, I just, it was so niche, but done so well. But also the way that they did it just told you he's watching now because something historic is about to happen. You know what yeah. I mean? And you just, it just puts you in the right mindset, but it was so cool and so out of left field as well. Um, the fact that we got a bit of like kind of an extended mix with Cap, Cap as well. Um, and he got like to talk. Um, I also really liked, you know, last week when Mag Magneto turned the lights off on the entire planet and then you just got Spider-Man going, what the fuck? I legitimately did the Leo pointing meme. And as I did it, I go, you're doing the Leo pointing meme. But I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? Fucking Spider Man, like, um, I love it because it makes sense. Because it was a thing a lot of like Boda Mayer was getting asked this question a lot to the point that he felt the need to answer it on Twitter. Uh, and he gave some bullshit about, oh, yeah, they, they're kind of off with the Cree army as well because he didn't want to give away that that you know they were going to be appearing in there a lot in the last episode. Um, but I love the fact because whenever you get these kind of apocalyptic events, you're like, where are the Avengers? You know what I mean? And it's like, well, yeah. no, there they are. They're protecting the president exactly where they should be. Um, and again, it's just a real fan servicey thing. Um, but also it's fan servicey in the right way. It's answering the questions that real fans have, and that's why you kind of get that authenticity off this show and off Bodomeo as a creator as well. So loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, the last episode chose instead of kind of getting big, which it did, like, don't get me wrong. But it chose to get quite small at times and be very much a character-based episode. Obviously, we started with, um, you know, Xavier and Magneto, presumably a memory, um, going back to when they first confessed to each other that they were mutants. Um, and that was kind of, that's a, a story that's, and, and the season began, obviously, with Xavier leaving the X-Men and everything that comes with it to Magneto. Um so again, that's kind of a core theme of all of these stories. And it was great to have it be such a central event when it mattered. Um, but I, I, what I love about it is the debates that it brings. And again, you can have this debate when you watch the original trilogy of movies or when you watch the original uh, animated series. And now we can have it in this world. Um, I guess kind of we'll just have the traditional debate. Kev... Are you Team mm. Magneto or Team Xavier based off this series? Uh, I think, well, because I'm not a mutant, I think I have to be Team Xavier. So, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fair. Um, uh, but no, I, seriously, like Magneto, I think was tricked by another mutant to kind of do what he did. Mm. So he's kind of filled with a lot of trauma, and he's still like, I think as much of a big game as he talks, he can still like easily be manipulated. By by someone else, so I think I have to be still team team Charles. Charles can always see like the bigger picture with logic, and I know he fucked off the planet for a while, but he was really to open. I think just to teach Magneto something, uh, and of course, what do you know? Magneto gets tricked into thinking it's not means are responsible for Genosha. So, yeah, uh, I, I I have to be team uh, team Charles. I think on this one, even okay. though he went through some kind of uh, interesting methods. I think at the yeah. Uh, this, this finale episode as well of really taking over uh, Eric's mind but it, it was an interesting approach where he's just like I'm gonna have orgies in space like you know what I mean it was an yeah. interesting <laughs> change of lifestyle where I didn't expect that to be where Charles Xavier was and what he was up to it was an interesting check back in that I'm much more plugged into a lot of 
fan fandom conversations around X Men as a result of this uh, and kind of getting back into it. And there is an element of the fandom that sees Charles Xavier as an asshole and as someone who you know essentially <laughs> was used child slaves and 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 kind of um is a narcissist who believes that uh in his way it is the only way. And we kind of saw that again. Like he's like Magneto's like you're gonna destroy my mind if you do this. And this is just your opinion versus mine. It's an ethical debate bait they're having um but he's like if i need to i'm gonna fuck you up and, and wipe your brain um where do you stand on the xavier versus magneto do you follow that line of talk because i know it's not everyone who reads the comics thinks it but i know xavier in the comics is a much more nuanced character and there's a lot more and again a lot of discussion around this is is xavier sneakily turning heel here which didn't happen in this episode but you could make a case for it. What are your own thoughts on, on this whole battle, uh, at least as portrayed in this series? I think a lot of people thought that this was going to end up going into a storyline where Professor Xavier kind of had his, his, his kind of mentality split, that he was going to mm. have a neat version, a good version. I mean, in the comics, he's like that as well, especially with modern eyes looking back. I mean, there's that famous scene now from one of the earlier X-Men issues where he confesses his love for Jean Grey, but says, I can never tell her. And, you do your research he's at you know at least 15 at the time and it's like whoa like this is not this is not good but i made this metaphor in a podcast before and it i kind of come back to this with a lot of things because it's one of the best storytelling devices i've ever heard being used uh, there's this terrible movie from the early 2000s called the one where Jet Li basically fights himself. And it's like producers got together and went, I want Jet Li to fight Jet Li and make it like the Matrix because that's it right now. And someone wrote this terrible film. But when Jet Li was doing his choreography, he wanted a good version of himself to use a martial art that specifically dealt in circular motions so he could always observe the problem from every angle. And then when the time was right, when he knew what was going on, he could attack. Whereas his evil version used a martial art that worked in like straight lines it was always moving forward it was incredibly aggressive and it created incredible dynamic in the fight scenes between the good jet lead bad jet lead and it actually kind of saved the movie a bit and i always remember hearing that and thinking that is such a fantastically smart way of telling a story between two opposing forces mm. and i think in this it was encapsulated very much there magneto was constantly moving forward blind to the damage he could possibly do after genosha and Professor Xavier tries to observe the entire situation from such a big circle that it's infuriating because he almost won't get his hands dirty. So that's the way I kind of saw these two characters. And I really, really liked how Magneto was infuriating because he was blinded by his rage, his determination, his end goals, that he just wanted to get past the means and get directly to the end. Whereas Charles just wasn't making that winning move the entire time. He was sitting back and almost taking too much time and Charles is an infuriating character in the comics and in the TV show but that makes for a good story makes for a good mm. character I mean I don't know really how many times he's done a heel turn how many times he's been killed and brought back because you know he's he is a divisive polarizing character and I think that's why it works so well because what he's doing is fundamentally wrong but do the ends justify the means mm, interesting I'm very much uh, Magneto is right. He is right. Like he is. And I'm I'm coming off uh, I, I hear what you're saying, Kev, around like, look, I'm a human, so I I'm I'm gonna oppose the destroy humanity stance. And that's I I get that. Um I'm coming off seeing, um, and I won't give any spoilers or any plot details away here, but I saw Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes at the weekend and I've watched the previous kind of recent uh, incarnations of those movies. And uh, so I'm very open to the fact that, yeah, you man, your dicks killed him. Like I'm very open to that, <laughs> that stance uh, in story. And I think uh, what I loved about this is that this series showed Magneto's capacity, propensity, and willingness to see the other side and change. Um and how and it told the story of how humanity still tried to persecute him and still saw him as that. He's such a sympathetic and interesting and three-dimensional character even when he's at his most villainous because again, he has that Holocaust survivor backstory and again, the, the, some of the lines that they gave him in the finale were just like, uh, like when he started like just kind of babbling in German and then spoke, went back to English and he's like, I can hear the boots, you know, and it was just so like fucking 
like you can hear the trauma in in his language and so on. Um, and I think the fact that again he even tried there was that stage where he went willingly on trial and still they tried to kill him um and still humanity was willing to sacrifice him and still he forgave them and still they came after him and it's like i i, I get it i would feel the same way we'd all be magneto if that is the case whereas yeah i think Xavier just needs to let go of his vision and it's like when the world is about to end Charles Xavier is like no we can still save them no we can still do this and it is like that just grates on me a little bit and I do want to see that fleshed out there were elements I loved a, a plot point I loved about this was um how Scott's relationship with Xavier and how Xavier had let him down as a father figure type and we all know if you especially if you watch the animated series how important that is uh, because Scott's got major daddy issues um but that kind of fleshed out Xavier even the fact that you know when he did this benevolent thing of um kind of backing up Jean Grey's theory that maybe he gave it to Magneto so we could get to have a life and Xavier's like that's exactly why I did it and Scott's like you're still an asshole you need to let us choose if that's what we want you still decided that for us so um I think there's complexities on both sides obviously Ma Magneto comes out as slightly more villainous um but I don't know I just see that as decisive and again in my planet in Apes mood, I'm open to the fact that maybe we're the bad guys. Um, so uh yeah, like I, I I but I love this whole debate and I love kind of the spirit at it. I'll tell you something else I loved, uh, and we need to make space for it because we never got a chance to discuss episode five, one of the best episodes of television you're gonna see this year, maybe one of the best animated episodes of TV you're ever gonna see, maybe the best one of the best episodes of television you're ever gonna see. Remember it. It is, of course, culminates in the death of Gambit. Um, very, very shocking episode. Obviously, uh, the slaughter in Genosha and kind of the uh, the rise and uh, and the beginning of the arc. Um, for obviously, uh, Bastion. Um, want to give you thoughts on this, Kev? I know this was something that had a visceral effect on 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 you this episode. I want to give you thoughts mm. on this Gambit's death. Do will we see him again? Like, what are your just just you can just speak on this. Um, yeah, just that this is the episode I think that really just really um clinched how good this this the writing on the show was. Um, also, before I actually go into this, did anybody else feel a bit dumb sometimes when uh the likes of Magneto or Charles or Beast or Bastion were talking than some of the, the dialogue and words they were using? Because <laughs> I, I I didn't understand some of the words. That they, were using. <laughs> like, they weren't big. I, words. I, I, I got that in this episode. I was like, wait, what was that one? Like, yeah. yeah. I, I think I know what he means, but I don't want to say anything because my, 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 my. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we can share this together, guys. Yeah. yeah. I, I have to get that out there. Like, just like we're, we're like geniuses, like you know. Yeah. Not really admitting to the, like the general public that we're stupid or anything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what a tracker mortgage is. We're having. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so like this is the episode. This is also the episode though as well that I think the animation um, yeah. really kind of outdid itself though as well with when Gambit and Rogue were fighting together with the motorbike scene with Gambit too. Um, I did find Rogue incredibly harsh in, in this episode in particular to Gambit. Uh, I mean... Like like we said in I think episode four, why can't you just put on one of those colors and she can touch Gambit maybe for like a little bit and then she's like, No, do you know what? Magneto's the only one that can touch me. Um but yeah, just the the animation style and the writing uh, in this episode and just the the consequences, because yeah, as we saw in like it wasn't the next episode, the episode after was just Gambit's funeral. And you're like, Oh, maybe they'll do time travel, right? Maybe they'll do time and they just don't. He's just gone. Um, and I really love that about him because he's such a fan favorite character. Um, but yeah, this was this was this was the episode that really kind of uh made me think, oh fuck, am I enjoying this more than Invincible? Yeah. <laughs> and your thoughts on episode five, Gambit's death, anything kind of jumping out for you? Well, the, the question everyone's been asking is like, how is Gambit gonna come back? And what I want it to be is he's not. I uh, think if you're going to commit to something like this, if you're going to kill off a major character, if you want stakes, commit to mm. it. Yes. Whereas so many people don't. I mean, we, we people still talk to this day about the damage that the death of Superman not only did to comic books, 
but just to stories in general. I mean, I remember during the last two seasons of Game of Thrones, everyone was wondering when Lady Stoneheart's going to show up. Mm. And if she does, oh, she's definitely going to resurrect Ned and Ned's going to do... And I was like, why would you bring Catelyn Stark and uh, Ned Stark back in that, the way they were telling the story? It wasn't going to work. It worked in the books, great. It wasn't going to work in this. It would have just damaged everything they've done. Um, if you gonna if you're gonna kill a character and it's gonna have gravitas and meaning and you're using the drug or story forward, commit, 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 and don't backtrack. Yeah, it's cheap. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree. And it was one of those things when we sat down and talked about the Bad Batch last uh, last week with Jerry. It was this. Uh, I'll give away plot details for that. But like, there was a major death in season two and season three. Everyone was expecting them to show back up, and the fact that they committed to it just made you respect it a lot more. Because again, it's like that emotion was real. So I totally agree. I don't want him. To, I do want him to come back, but I don't <laughs> want the sadness that I felt to be disrespected. And I didn't do that. that. Thing of him to come yeah. back that makes it mean so much more yes, so it, yeah. it's totally fine and plus you've got other mediums you've got like so many different alternate universes blah 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 but you should want Gambit to come back but you should also realise that that want is what's making this mean so much yes totally agree 100% cannot agree more um, I thought the episode was an absolute masterpiece um, again it was that kind of um moments where we're all like this is something special it was yeah. Ned Stark at the end of season one of Game of Thrones where we're like holy yeah. shit we're in for something um and like just the 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 writing was so devastating like when uh you know I, I agree with your opinions on Rogue there I'm like there's one difference between saying like I have to break your heart you know and, and understanding that look I'm gonna I'm gonna go off with Magneto and then there's like Flying in the air and dancing with Magneto to Ace of Base, like in front of Gambit. Rude, rude. but like, um, definitely wrote that scene, yeah. yeah um, <laughs> but then at the end, and how we kind of knew that Gambit was gone was so devastating. Where it's like, Sugar, I can't feel you, and she had the gloves off, and you're just like, the first time she's ever touched, you know what I mean? And it's like, mm. oh, my. Fucking God, it broke me. Um, And what I loved about the show, though, is apart from maybe one episode and it was just kind of a resetting episode, I think it was episode seven, Um, it, it didn't dip. You know what I mean? It kept at that high quality and it kept the stakes high. It did, It's not just like there's a big peak in the middle and then like it was just an average show from there on. The stakes raised and they kept them that high. It was phenomenal, but I totally agree with Dan. I, I don't want to see him come back because, yeah, the death has to mean something. Um. I want to touch on where we've left our characters now um, and what you want and expect for kind of season two. Um, obviously, we have in ancient Egypt, we have uh, Nightcrawler, Beast, Xavier, Rogue, and Magneto uh, with Ensa Uh Dan, if anyone didn't recognize him or pick up on the cues, do you want to? I think it's, I think, I don't think it's a spoiler to give it away. Like, you can no, look no, at his no. face. Look, yeah. It's an it's apocalypse. Yeah. So, Everyone thought that maybe it's season two we were going into the Onslaught story, but it looks like we're going into the actual Age of Apocalypse story, which explains, I think it was episode seven and eight, the introduction had an extra scene of a one-armed Wolverine with like these red face tattoos. That's the Wolverine from Age of Apocalypse. So there was a little bit of foreshadowing there. Um, They're going into it a completely different way, but yeah, Apocalypse is back and hopefully they're going to write them properly. Amazing. Um, what what are your thoughts heading into season two and where we've kind of left our characters again? Also, we have Cyclops <clears throat> and Gene in the future with Child Nathan. So the the Child Nathan thing, because Kev asked about that earlier. So the Child Nathan is a separate character to Cable. So this is Nate Gray, not Nathan Summers. Uh, um, and this is the character hmm. we discussed on a. I don't know. It was we were definitely talking about some other movie. I think we were actually talking about the Marvels when that was coming up, and I was explaining to you X Men, the dimension time traveling X Men. So this is an early version of Cable before he gets the techno virus, right. which makes him go to coppers and dance all night. But yeah, that was terrible. Oh, solid. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, 
Night Grey is a major deal in a lot of the the big big stories from uh, the kind of millennium of the X Men. So he he's a key player in the Age of Apocalypse story. He pretty much sets it up. So this futuristic world that we're seeing i remember reading the comics back when we used to get those reprinted a4 x-men comics back in like the mid 90s and it was this oddly terrifying story of uh of gene and 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 uh, cyclops witnessing nave becoming cable when he he got infected with the with virus um and i remember not understanding as a kid it was had a kind of a, like really like body horror themes to it so we've seen there's a little bit of body horror in this season so if they're going to be leading into the age of apocalypse story we're going to see nate gray in his x-man iteration which i'm mm-hmm. stoked for so and then with apocalypse showing back up everyone thought it was going to be onslaught which is one of my favorite stories but onslaught served a really, really unique purpose. And I want Kev to give his two cents on this, but the thing about the onslaught thing, which was a bit weird for me, is and this isn't really a spoiler because they can't do this in the cartoons. The ending of the onslaught story was specifically designed to get rid of a lot of comics that in the late nineties were causing Marvel to hemorrhage money. So they did this big saga in which they killed off the characters that were not making them any money at all. And let me just tell you real quick who these characters were. So it's the Fantastic Four, the Avengers, Scarlet Witch, Captain America, <laughs> and Iron Man. Wow. Okay. So all the characters. That's all the comics after this. The, the, those characters were not making money back then. And then it actually kind of turned on them and reintroduced the characters with a lot of like gusto, but they're not going to use this to kill off the universe Avengers. But what I was thinking was, if they did this, but the X-Men had to sacrifice themselves the way the Avengers did, leading to season three, maybe that could be our explanation of how we get the X-Men into the actual MCU. Mm-hmm. So it could be the X-Men 97 guys coming in. This is a wild theory. It looks like we're not getting it now, but maybe in the future, maybe if there's going to be a season three, we could see this being the loophole that gets them into this universe. So... Ooh. I'm excited, but um, if they're going to do the Age of Apocalypse story, there's going to be a lot of big, intense fight scenes. We'll see a lot of mutant powers being used really, really uniquely, and I'm really stoked for Season 2. Okay, amazing. Kev, any kind of hopes, expectations from yourself for Season 2? Uh, I think Season 2 is going to be interesting, because like, it's essentially going to be like three timelines going on, yeah. presumably, for, for all the seasons. So you got past, present, future, um, but I do think it'll be a great way to introduce um, other X-Men, maybe, that didn't make the cut for the present uh, timeline um, of of Forge kind of making his own new X Men team. I think in the present, so um, I think that'd be good. It's just the biggest thing I think will be maybe not so much the pacing, but I think one of the best things actually one of the best things about the show is it's 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 snappy pacing, but it's switching between the three different stories and times and having it feel right and kind of and, and make sense. I think as well will be their biggest. And I know you said it was already it's already written and they've got a, a, a huge amount of faith after this season. But I think doing these three timelines coherently will be a it will be a big ask. But I I feel like they'll they'll absolutely pull it off though. Yeah, yeah, I I've complete faith in them to do so. I would be interested in seeing what Forge's mid uh, X Men team looks like. Do you know what I mean? And how that I mean, like shapes out. We haven't seen Colossus or yeah. Quicksilver. Um, there's Quicksilver too. Yeah, uh, yeah. There, there's one that was on the wall as well. So like, yeah, there's interesting. I want to go back and get some freeze frame, um, and see like what mm. what. Well, who not only who was there because look, we can go on and, and just Google all the X Men and then pick out the people we didn't see, but like who was there and what was said about them, you know what I mean? And and just the status of it, it's interesting. Um, let's talk about season one then as a whole and kind of reflect on our, our, our kind of final thoughts. Um, again, Kev, I'll start with yourself coming in, and we I know we've kind of got kind of where you are, but just any kind of last reflections, um from coming into it kind of fairly fresh and then just getting completely getting turned around. Like what are your, what are your final reflections on season one? Yeah. Like the, the, to me, this is, and I, and I, I don't say this kind of like lightheartedly, this is the best ad- or television Marvel's put out period. Like, mm, yeah. Uh, and Loki was probably would have been maybe edged up there for me in terms of a season one and two together. But uh, I think this edges it out. Like it's just every episode, was important and meant something and there wasn't like a the only lull was maybe that um the jubilee episode where they go to they get sucked into the video game but i think that was a nice little break though as well so i can't yeah. really fault it too much um but yeah i can't believe i considered 
I, I can't believe I'm actually saying that I considered maybe passing on this show uh, at the start. Um, and I was just like, oh, I'll see what the first two episodes are like, and then was hooked in. But I mean, um, yeah, I hope it. Insp- I hope it inspires uh, just them to do as good a job in season two, basically. I think as they did in season in season one. Um, and I also kind of hope it inspires like other TV shows though to to really um, step it up a notch and kind of try and compete with how good this was and like this is how you do a fucking good mm. season of 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 a superhero uh, animated show and maybe that it'll with all the cameos in it as well maybe they'll do Spider Man now as well or maybe they'll do some Avengers uh, animated show as well because um, they found lightning in a bottle again in the show I think. Um, and it kind of felt like the kind of show as well that the studio maybe had little interference with because nobody had uh, like crazy, crazy high hopes for it. Mm. Um, but I think if like I don't think Deadpool and Wolverine is going to be a, a flopper or anything like that, but I think it's really safe. Marvel is here. This show. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And Spider Man and Amazing Friends are coming back as well. They're going to be rebuilding that too. So they they've got oh, really? it. So, yeah, it'd be an interesting one to check out. I love how bought in you are, having been on this journey through these calls. Uh, you yeah. went from like, oh, is that starting this week? To yes, I love it, and this is what I want. <laughs> love it. Love being on this journey. It's been a pleasure, Dan. Uh, your final reflections on on season one. Season one was written specifically for people like me. So. Let me give you a really quick summarized story. So when I first started reading comics, the comic you see right here behind me, this one at the end, that's yes. my first ever American comic. It's it's not the original one I bought. My sister poured Coke all over it, but it's one I retracked down. But I'm really, really happy that I got it. When I started reading comics, obviously, there was no internet. There was nothing like that. You just learn about stuff gradually by those little editor's notes, the asterisks, read this, read that, and you buy, you source these comics. And there was one comic as a kid I really, really wanted, and that was Wolverine number 75. And it was the one where his adamantium was removed from. About 11 years ago, I was in a comic shop called Orbital Comics over in London, which is fortunately now gone, and I walked in. And after searching for my entire teenage and adult life, I finally found Wolverine hey. himself, which is one of my pride joy comics. Also, I don't know if you can see it. You probably can't. Bring back holograms. holograms are awesome. <laughs> I remember going up to the person there and they priced it wrong and everything. It was just absolutely brilliant, but I've got it now. And it, it to see scenes from that comic that I chased for most of my collecting life, to see that directly taken out of the pages of a comic I genuinely, genuinely love and put into an episode that was so strong sums up exactly how I feel about it. They just looked at their viewer base and said, people who watch this and loved it and spent their money on this and played X-Men in their schoolyards are now middle-aged men in most cases. Let's write this for them. Let's not patronize them. Let's grow with them the way they grew up with us and i'm just gonna say to the entire team and everyone who was involved from the fans thank you for doing such a good job love it love it love it that this is why we do these shows Uh, i love uh hearing that story and, and thank you for sharing to kind of wrap up my own thoughts on season one i think Unless it turns out that Bodomeo like was a major like creep or did something awful or something like that Disney needs to find a way to make amends with him because this is someone who gets it at a time when Marvel really need people who get it. He nailed this. This, I I, I don't disagree with what you say there, Kev. I need to probably give it a little more thought, but I don't, dis- I, I, when you said this is the best Marvel TV show, I'm like, I, I don't hate that opinion. Uh, and it probably is my favorite X-Men property ever as well. Now, yeah. I'm not like, I, I I don't have Dan's kind of CV when it comes to X-Men, but je- it, it's, it's uh, I do love them and I have watched like kind of a lot of it in my past and this may be the, as good as it gets. I spent the entire season, just to kind of give you an example, I was like, ah, oh, like I want more Wolverine. I want more Wolverine. And then we get a big Wolverine twist. And I was like, I don't want it. Oh my God, what the hell? But it was thrilling. And everything that happens here hit so hard. But I love that about the show and the, how much time they made for even minor characters again. And, and without ever feeling box ticky, how they just told the story they wanted to tell. Even the bits I didn't like, like fuck Roberto and Jubilee. Like, but again, I'm like, I admire the fact that you feel confident enough 
to like just go on a side mission with them as well and just kind of give us that episode and you still make a great TV show so even if they're not my favourite characters I'm still all on board they somehow managed to give us everything we wanted out of this take up all of our hopes our wishes our expectations and just surpass them in just 10 episodes there was everything you got from the show can't be nonsense that's what i think of you know what i mean kind of crazy wild storylines kind of just absolute sidetracks and just randomness happening but then there's also really really high stakes and kind of that addition of it being the the benefit to it being 10 episodes rather than say a 22 episode season is that you can give us one one kind of through line storyline from start to finish and that's what we just never experienced that with an animated x-men show and never mind done as highly as this which is as good as any television on show uh, like show today animated or not kind of regenerating the x-men exactly when they needed to and kind of regenerating our faith in marvel tv as well having meaningful character development having deaths that like gambits where we're like holy shit and they seem to be sticking to it fun cameos keeping it fun as well with the dialogue and keeping it funny uh, they hit on everything they wanted was there bits I could have had more of and and less of throughout? Sure, like like I said, fuck Jubilee and Roberto. Who gives a shit about them? But like, and where's the B storyline? Like, why is Wolverine now just going with the flow? Whatever anyone else says, he's like, yeah, I think we should do that. Yeah, we'll have a birthday party for Jubilee. Let's have a birthday party for Jubilee. Why is he so chilled? Um, but these are all kind of minor nitpicks, and there's literally one episode of this that I didn't absolutely love out of out of 10 episodes. And and again, like, I didn't hate that episode. It was the one with Roberto and Jubilee. I was like, okay, yeah, it's fine just for a switch up. And we, I guess we need a bit of that in this season. Um, But nine out of 10 episodes I loved. And you're not going to get that hit rate with many series. And I, what I expected this to be was a bit of fluff to kind of put me in the mood nicely for Deadpool and Wolverine. But now it's all I want to see. And I cannot wait now for my movies rewatch that's going to lead me into Deadpool and Wolverine. This is going to be in my end of year top 10 shows. I loved every second. And like I said, it may be the best thing Disney Plus has released in a good while. I feel confident about that. Um, and I don't hate Kev's assertion that it's the, the best thing that they've ever released. Um, I'd mentioned it there. I do want to touch on it because it is the next big Marvel thing. Deadpool and Wolverine. This obviously conveniently timed, set it up perfectly. Um, what do you guys want from this, Dan? What are you looking for from this movie? Just full blown fan service. We got a great story from this. Don't worry about doing the convoluted stories you've been reliant on with Echo and Secret Invasion and stuff now. Just give us Cheech and Chong, like superheroing <laughs> it through the multiverse. That's what I want. I want dick jokes. I want inappropriateness. I want Paul Heyman to write this shit. <laughs> and I just want everything that you know the fans who are going to be the guys who are buying the hot toy collectibles and buying the expensive shit you release. Just appeal to us. Give us all the shit that we know so we can feel in our sad little life superior to the guy sitting beside us in a cinema. I know who that character is. You don't. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I love the honesty <laughs> Kev what are your kind of hopes and expectations for them yeah uh, kind of the same as Dan I just want a big fun stupid movie uh, to, just to say goodbye to the old Fox, uh, the Fox franchise full of cameos from all those movies because uh, like we grew up with the Fox era um, and they do they do meet a certain amount to us like as well so um, I wouldn't mind Hugh Jackman this the, the Logan that's being portrayed in this movie coming into the MCU and uh, maybe at the end of this as well as like a second Logan for something down the line. Cause like, look, he's fucking brilliant at the part. He's, he's the Logan. He's like the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man a little bit for us. So uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's my hopes and expectations. It was a big dumb movie full of, as Dan said, dick jokes and fourth wall breaking and cameos and madness. Love it. One thing I'd like to add to it that I'd like to see what I don't think we're going to get. Cause it would leak now, but do you remember the canceled 1980s Wolverine movie? Yeah. Remember who was supposed to play Wolverine? No, who was it? Danny DeVito. I wanted that. Stop. There's concept pictures out there of of Danny DeVito, like he looked in Twins, in the brown Wolverine outfit with the claws. But they look like, for for some reason, the concept work looks like a beer advert, like a really (laughs) big one. But everyone, you guys included, have a look, Google Danny DeVito Wolverine. You will not be disappointed. Give us Danny DeVito, Wolverine. (laughs) We need it. 
Give us the DeVito cut. This is what we want. Um, There may be recency bias here, but I'm okay if X-Men just became the focal point after this for all of the MCU. Yep. Like, we had Captain America mo- mo- movie news leaked during the midweek, and you had the Agatha All Along uh, series got a release date for September. But honestly, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I don't care that much now. I felt like Endgame kind of wrapped up the storylines of the characters we spent years investing in perfectly. And since then, it's all felt a little little bit flat until now there's a regeneration of energy here and i just want to ride that wave like it feels totally x-men just feels totally fresh it feels vibrant there's hunger with it and it's just like a new playground for marvel to play in and that's what i want and i think there's such endless potential here and they're off to such a strong start here um i think it's going to be great because it needs to be great and there's so much here to work with and i think they've given us about five percent of what they have in the trailer itself i think it's it's just going to feel like a Royal Rumble match where it's like the countdown. You're like, that guy, that guy, that guy, yes! And that's what I want from it, again. Um, but I do want some kind of forward propulsion and to understand how the X-Men fit in it because they've made us wait for so long and teased us. Like, one division was four and a half years ago now where they teased, like, Quicksilver uh, and that kind of crossover there as well. And it turned out to be Ralph Boner. Um, so we've waited. We deserve this. Give it all to us. Uh, I cannot wait. I'm buzzing. And I'd love to chat with you guys about it afterwards. Uh, before we go, guys, uh, just if, if you've entered the plug or if you don't have entered the plug, is there anything that you're enjoying right now? Do you want to just give a special mention to Kev? I know you've got a busy few weeks ahead of you. Yeah, uh, we are playing... Sorry, my, my band uh, fan club. We're playing... Uh, in uh limerick on the 23rd uh kerry on the 24th cork on the 31st and then dublin on the 1st of june in Whelan's, and then we'll have a new ep out on the 14th of june so proper plug in here uh go out and listen to fan club stuff on spotify we would love you to come to our show as well love thank it. you so much love you bye <laughs> dan anything you're loving at the moment and you are uh, yeah, but, uh, my uh, favorite uh, franchise of all time, Lady Dead and uh, comics. That's having its 30th anniversary. Uh, there's a lot of Kickstarters going on at the moment. There's free PDFs of the comic you can download, see what you're interested into. They're doing the first Lady Dead computer game right now. Highly recommend jumping on that. And then, um, very, very early days, uh, Jerry, you know, there's a project I'm working on. Yeah. Um, watch this space. Stuff okay. Happening. Okay, okay, okay. You're interested. I know, I know a bit more about that. So yeah, I can't wait to get to talk about that. Interesting. Um, I love the fact that it's ready. You feel like uh, it's good to talk about here. Um, guys, thank you so much. It's Over been a six pleasure. Months, but yeah. It's been a pleasure having these conversations uh, with you. And you know what? I'd like to have more because you know what, guys. You think you're the only nerds who talk about TV in the world? Tan, Kev, you've just become part of a bigger universe. You just don't know it yet. I'm here to talk to you about something we call the Dragon Boys of Summer. And I'm not going to mention what that is. I'm going to just leave it there as a nice little teaser. But uh, yeah, we'll just leave it there. Dan, Kev, thanks for joining us as always here on page 180. Thank you so much. Dragon Boys of Summer! (laughs) Cheers, guys. (laughs) 